My name is Dr. Elias Kajianos, and I'm a urologic oncologist at the Ottawa Hospital in Ottawa, Canada. In this video, I will discuss the procedure of robotic radical prostatectomy. Robotic radical prostatectomy is used in the treatment for men with prostate cancer. We'll begin by reviewing some basic anatomy. This is a picture of the male pelvis in cross section. I've circled the prostate inside the yellow circle. As we can see, the prostate lies underneath the bladder, between the bladder and the urethra or the urine channel. It lies on top of the rectum. We will now go to a close-up view of the same anatomy. In the close-up view, we see the bladder, the prostate, and the urethra. And now we're also looking at the seminal vesicles, which are glands that lie behind the prostate and are attached to the prostate. These are important because prostate cancer can grow from the prostate into the seminal vesicles. And so these are routinely removed as part of the operation. In these next few diagrams, I will describe the technical aspects of the procedure. So when we remove the prostate, we make an opening at the bladder where the prostate is attached and we divide the prostate from the urine channel. The yellow lines we're seeing in this diagram are the nerves that are responsible for erectile function. This diagram shows a nerve sparing operation where the nerves that are responsible for erections are preserved. Not all patients are candidates for nerve sparing, and this has to do with the exact specifications of the cancer. In cases where the cancer is felt to be more advanced, where there's a greater chance of breakthrough, nerve sparing may not be appropriate. This is something we'll discuss in person or you can discuss with your treating surgeon. After the prostate has been removed, the bladder is then pulled down and anastomosed or attached to the urethra. This repair uh, requires suturing and because the bladder is always filling with urine, you can get some leakage through the repair line. And that's why you temporarily will require a catheter after the operation. The catheter is a hollow tube that is placed into your bladder and will drain the urine directly, allowing the area of the anastomosis to heal. Generally, the catheter is left in place for approximately seven days time. But again, the exact time may differ depending on the amount of reconstruction required to connect the bladder back to the urethra. In men who have big prostates, for example, a larger opening might be required at the bladder. And this repair may, requ may require somewhat longer to heal, and so the catheter may be left in for a longer period of time. Radical prostatectomy can be performed in a number of different ways. The original approach is an open radical prostatectomy, which is performed through a lower abdominal midline incision. This is still a good way of doing the operation, but I am performing the surgery with a minimally invasive technique called robotic radical prostatectomy. Robotic radical prostatectomy incorporates the benefits of minimally invasive surgery, but also does add various technological advancements that allow the surgery to be performed, in my opinion, in a higher level fashion. With robotic radical prostatectomy, rather than using the one larger lower abdominal midline incision that is shown in the dotted line in this diagram, we use a six port technique. A port refers to a hollow thin tube that is placed inside the abdominal wall. And then we introduce our instruments through these ports to allow us to do the operation. The initial entry is done with a camera and the location of that is above the belly button as shown in the C placement on this diagram. We blow up the abdomen with carbon dioxide gas to create a large working environment. And then we place our robotic camera. The benefits of the robotic camera is that it gives 10 times binocular magnified vision, giving us a three dimension, three dimensional topographic high resolution view. Enhanced vision is really just one of the benefits of robotic surgery. 
The benefit of robotic surgery over regular laparoscopy, which also uses minimally invasive port placement similar to this, is that it does allow for greater ability to do fine tuned movements. With regular laparoscopy, instruments have a limited range of motion. They are able to be twisted and spun around, but they do not have the ability to change the angle at the instrument tip level, similar to what our wrists do with our hands. This makes the delicate dissection required for radical prostatectomy very challenging. Robotic surgery allows us to regain this fine tuned motion by providing us with wristed instruments. And so anything that we could do with our hands, spinning, twisting, changing the angle of approach are able to be done with a robotic surgical platform. With robotic surgery, rather than controlling the, the instruments directly, the instruments are attached to the surgical arms of the patient aspect of the robotic platform. This diagram shows one of the arms where the instruments are attached to. And I, as the surgeon, will sit beside the patient and manipulate these instruments through a surgical console that has two hand controllers. I will use these, these hand controllers and my motions are translated directly inside the patient at the instrument tip level. The benefit of this over regular laparoscopy or controlling the instruments directly are twofold. First of all, there is motion scaling, meaning that my motions are broken down and fine tuned. When I move my hands on the console, three millimeters, the instruments inside the patient only move one millimeter. So all my motions become very delicate and very methodical and very precise. Furthermore, there is something called tremor filtration where any unwanted motions are filtered out. So again, all my motions are very precise and very delicate and very accurate. This with the enhanced ability to manipulate the instruments and the larger working space created by essentially miniaturizing my hands and placing them at the level of the instrument tips allows for better performance of the surgery. This diagram shows an overview of the entire robotic platform. It shows the surgeon at the surgeon console using the two hand controllers, looking through the viewfinder, which again gives 10 times binocular magnified vision. And over on the right, we see the nurse with the robotic arms of the surgical robot overlying the bed where the patient would be lying. And so again, the surgeon manipulates the hand console at the surgeon console and the instruments are moved by the robotic arms that are inside the patient. To summarize, the benefits of robotic radical prostatectomy have to do with, firstly, the minimally invasive approach. So smaller cuts results in less need for pain medication and a quicker recovery. In fact, patients following robotic prostatectomy are typically in hospital for 24 hours. They'll have their surgery on the one day, they will go home the following day. Most patients do not take pain medication for longer than a few days, although everyone is somewhat variable. In addition to the minimally invasive approach and less pain and quicker recovery, it is felt that the visual benefits of the three-dimensional 10 times uh, binocular magnified view, which allows for better visualization, does, does set up the surgeon for success. Furthermore, the benefits of tremor filtration and motion scaling, as well as wristed movements, allow for the most delicate, accurate form of dissection, all of which I feel lead to robotic prostatectomy being the ideal fashion in which to perform a radical prostatectomy. I will now discuss some of the possible side effects of robotic radical prostatectomy. When discussing surgical side effects, we can break these down into short-term complications and long-term complications. Short-term complications would include those that are happening during the actual time of the surgery. These would include infection, 
which can occur anytime we make a cut on the body, whether it's a larger open incision or the small laparoscopic incisions we make with robotic prostatectomy. We do give some prophylactic antibiotics at the time of surgery and the risk of infection is very minor. Bleeding is another possible complication with radical prostatectomy. With a robotic approach, partly because we're able to see so well, secondarily because of the gas pressure um, that is provided, which does not allow for minor little oozing, significant bleeding is very uncommon and transfusion rates are less than 1%. So bleeding is a relatively minor complication of robotic radical prostatectomy. Other potential complications will include lymphatic leaks from doing a lymph node dissection. And the extent of lymph node dissection varies depending on certain aspects of the cancer. This can be further discussed at the time of the surgical consultation. Other possible short-term complications would include rectal injury. The rectum lies directly behind the prostate and the prostate can be fairly stuck on the, prost uh, on the rectum if patients have had previous radiation, for example, or if they have various um, number of biopsies, which may cause some scarring at the, between the prostate and the rectum. Rectal injury does remain uncommon for most patients with a less than 1% possibility of this occurring. Other general medical complications of an anesthetic uh, may occur. These can be complications such as heart attacks or heart failure or blood clots. These are very uncommon for most patients with robotic radical prostatectomy. However, they are more common in patients who have pre-existing medical problems with their heart, for example. The most relevant complications to discuss with radical prostatectomy are the long-term complications. And these are the impact on urine control and sexual function. Urine control tends to be terrific following robotic radical prostatectomy. Most patients ultimately do regain urine control. This may take a few weeks at a minimum or more likely a few months in order for this to return. By a year after surgery, approximately 90% of, pa of patients will be nice and dry. So severe incontinence or leakage of urine occurs in approximately 10% of patients. In those who are dry, a certain number, 20 to 30%, may have some very mild stress leakage or stress incontinence. This implies that although men are predominantly dry, with heavy lifting or straining or coughing or sneezing, there may be a few leaks of urinary drippage. This is very minor. Some men will, cho will choose to wear a security pad for this. Many men will not. But to summarize, the majority of men with normal urine control prior to surgery will regain normal urine control postoperatively. The impact on sexual function can be more profound. Factors that will dictate what degree of sexual function will return after surgery are the age of the patient going into the surgery, whether nerve sparing is done on one or two sides. And again, this will be discussed at the time of the surgical consultation, depending on aspects of the cancer. And the quality of the erections going into the operation. Older men with weaker erections going into surgery will have worse outcomes than younger men with normal erections going into surgery, despite equal amounts of nerve sparing. A final impact long-term that can develop is scar tissue or contracture forming, typically where the urethra is reattached or reanastomosed back to the bladder. With robotic surgery, because her visualization is so good, the anastomosis tends to be really, really high quality. And so the risk of scarring is far lower than traditionally was seen with open surgery. The risk of significant scarring or narrowing would be in the neighborhood of one to 2%. In this video, we have discussed robotic radical prostatectomy, going over some of the technical aspects of the operation, as well as possible complications in the recovery. Clearly, further information can be provided at the time of our inpatient, in-person consultation or on the telephone. Any questions, you can feel free to contact my office and we will go over your questions. 
I hope this information has helped to answer many of your original questions and helped you better understand the potential treatment you are contemplating and undertaking.